Welcome to Better Sex, where you get the information and inspiration to create and enjoy your best possible sex life. Join your host, sex therapist Jessa Zimmerman, as she brings you expert guests, helpful tips, knowledge, and strategies to improve your intimate relationships. And now, your host, Jessa Zimmerman. Hey, this is Jessa. Welcome back to the Better Sex Podcast. Thank you for tuning in and spending some of your day with me. We're talking about something today that comes up frequently in my practice and can be such a huge burden for men. And I I suppose I am talking about cis men at the moment, penis owners. We're talking about performance anxiety, the kinds of pressure that men can be under to perform based on their expectations, (laughs) both theirs and their partners potentially, and the stress that that can create and then the distress that that can create and what in the world can they do about this? And um, David Kalili is my guest and he writes about this a lot. So he's got some great ideas if this is something that you are struggling with, have struggled with, if you are partnered with a person who might struggle with this, I think this is gonna be useful and I hope you enjoy it. And before we start the show today, it is sponsored by Intimacy with Ease. It's a method to help otherwise happy couples achieve a sex life that is easy and fun for both of them. So you can actually just enjoy your sex life with zero stress. For more information, if you want to watch a brief little training video that's available, all of that, go to intimacywithease.com. So, David, thank you so much for being on the show with me. Thank you very much, Jess. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, this is a great topic. (laughs) Anxiety (laughs) comes up all the time in our Uh our work, you know? Yeah. Could we start, though, because you did, I guess you've got a a history working in sex shops. Uh (laughs) And I'm curious sort of what that was like and how, I don't know if that led directly to the work you're doing or how you see the, you know, what's carried over as themes. So what directly led me to this work was actually... I took a psychology class in community college and then decided to take a sexuality class. And that professor just drew me in. Somebody did a good job. Huh? He did a great <laughs> job. Yeah. I would have oftentimes, both in the sex shop in Texas and in San Rafael, California, male identified folks coming in that were really shy. I mean, they would, and this is not to shame or judge, but you know, they had the Unabomber outfit on. They would have the hoodie and the sunglasses and make sure I mean, no one... anonymous uh-huh. and, yeah, like <laughs> disguise. Yeah. And you know, this was before the internet was as accessible as, as it is now. Yeah. It was right on the cusp. So that was also interesting to see things start to move over. So as guys had to come in, in person, I would just see the embarrassment or anxiety about wanting certain toys, wanting prostate massagers, wanting cock rings, educating them about cock rings, educating them about different types of lube, I loved educating about whether or not or in what situations to use numbing lube because they would, you know, oftentimes guys would come in saying, I premature ejaculate, should I use numbing lube? And then we talk about the pros and cons and, you know, Wow. but just the amount of of shame and and shyness and feeling like, oh, I should just have a hard dick and it should just start and stop whenever I want it to. And I shouldn't need any assistance whatsoever. And it's just another way that men being impacted with don't ask for help sort of narratives yeah, just yeah. Falls, falls down the line. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think I hear what you're saying. Like in what you're saying, I hear some people are looking for things to amplify their pleasure, uh-huh. potentially, if they're looking for prostate massage or something like that. But a fair amount of what you saw were people looking for help. Like they're yeah. having what they think of at least as trouble in sex. And is there something that can help me with this? Absolutely. Right. Yeah. And they're shy asking for that help. Right. I'm sure. I mean, just I know from my own clients, right? Shame and uh-huh. embarrassment and what's wrong with me and I'm broken. And yeah. 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 And I've all, you know, I've often thought, and I've I think I've probably written or talked about it to to some degree, the pressure that men are under, Mm, you know, in our society to sort of, I don't know, know what they're doing, be ready to go, Mm -hmm. you know, all these ideas that maybe people buy into that set them up to feel anxious. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like they are pressured to get hard fast, stay hard for a long time. Mm -hmm. And if they come to come a lot, 
and you know if they feel like they hit they don't hit one or any of those markers then they have you know quote unquote failed as a man you know yeah. and, and dicks are wonderful and they've got a lot of purpose and and pleasure but there's a tremendous amount of the rest of your body to play with and that gives you pleasure and lots of nerve endings and i think of it as you know you're a whole ass human a whole body a whole map and you <laughs> right. get to explore that map and while there's a lot of nerve yeah. endings in our uh, genitalia there's nerve endings all over and so to relieve that pressure that men get to just focus on their penis really opens up their repertoire opens up their definition of intimacy and, and connection and pleasure yeah and just like any other body part it works differently someday right <laughs> like it's like you know other parts are allowed to be somewhat That's tickled a good point. it's like yeah. why, why can't a penis you my know? ankle is doing a number on me today but i'm not yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah we're not freaking out because my knee hurts necessarily mm -hmm. right to me it's, it makes sense because i see this enough but how is this turning into to anxiety they may haunt a guy when he goes into sex yeah i see it leading men to really like, perseverate and worry leading up to uh, a date or even just calling a partner or calling a prospective partner, just thinking about being with a partner. Someone reached out to me today. Sometimes I go on Reddit and answer some questions for fun and practice. So someone said, you know, I have a date tonight and I know that they're expecting sex. Should I just cancel it? Because I'm just feeling, should I just wash away the whole? And that I think captures a common thing, which is that all or nothing avoidance that comes from anxiety yeah. because of the embarrassment and shame, because it's so high risk for some men to not perform well sexually, that they would just rather, and I've been there in my past for sure, that they would just rather avoid entirely and scrap it, you know? Yeah. And I think working with men to build that self-compassion, to build that opportunity for, it's not going to go perfect, but good enough. <laughs> you know, yeah, and that yeah, to be okay yeah. and human and expected. Right. And I'm sure, I'm sure you have too. I've worked with men where even like one experience where they lose their erection or something, something seems to go wrong. Yeah. You know, some people so latch onto that. Right. And ruminate. And, and, you know, of course, how in the world could you get aroused if you're that worried? Right. too? Exactly. Right. Like it's such a it's such a cycle people can get yeah. into. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think to be stuck in our head with anxiety and worry is the antithesis to being in this full body present minded, you know, for sex and for pleasure. And I'm not saying it under this like romantic guise of sex, but even just uh, banging it out, you know, it's going to be hard to do it within when you're just not present and in your head. Right. Right. Yeah. What'd you say to the guy on Reddit who said, you know, I've got a date and should I, you know, and I'm kind of freaking out about this. I know they'll be expecting sex. Should I just cancel? I, you know, I, I validated, I, I understood, you know, I, I shared that I understood his concern. And then I offered him just some things to think about in terms of what would be in between the banging it out and avoiding it altogether. And what's a way that he can, and that's a thing that's in my workbook is like figuring out a way to communicate it to a partner or partners in a way that that is in your own voice. So kind of offering him some prompts, you know, kind of normalizing that it's okay to go slow, normalizing, you know, giving a heads up of like maybe some demisexuality of, you know, wanting to get to know the person beforehand and trying to kind of soften up the expectations. And if they do have sex, then wonderful. And that's an exciting turn of events. But if not, then then they've had time to cuddle and kiss or whatever it is, that, or watch a movie or throw axes, whatever people do these days. Do you generally suggest, or, or under what conditions do you suggest that people actually reveal their struggles with a potential partner? You know, because it's sort of one thing to say, oh, let's go slow and I'm not quite ready for sex. But, you know, when should, when should a guy actually say, hey, I've had some issues with this. I get, you know, I've got this anxiety it gets in my way. Could we explore this together? Yeah, that's a great. Yeah. And you picked up that I didn't offer it to that guy. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I think, you know, as, as early as possible, if you feel vulnerable enough, if you feel safe and vulnerable enough for that person, you know, I have a trick where I, I do public speaking and I, I've taught classes and I still have anxiety and, you know, I just know it about myself. I know that the first few minutes I'm going to get tunnel vision and I'm, my hands are going to be a little sweaty and then it passes and then I'm okay because I'm in this profession of a therapist that talks about feelings. I get to talk about feelings. And so I'll say, I'm, I'm nervous right now. And in a few minutes, this is going to stop. And then, you know, I'll probably speak a little more fluidly. I wouldn't recommend that to a lawyer. I wouldn't recommend that to certain other certain professions. And so I want to be aware of who I'm talking to before I recommend how they talk about their anxiety. But if they are going to have a long-term relationship, I think that that is really important for sure. 
yeah. thing to be emotionally vulnerable and available to right. talk openly. Yeah. But it also seems, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like even in a somewhat casual relationship or dating for a month or, you know, something, it seems like such a catch-22 that if you don't share this struggle so that you bring the expectation down and have a partner with you in this, like that that's the way to overcome it. Because otherwise, it's still going to, there's going to come that moment where I'm supposed to have a heart on, you know, and it's like this test. I, I, I hear that so much from people. Right. And if you name it, if you kind of label the emotion, then that does wonders in its own. Yeah. And I work a lot with some men who really like hookup culture and anonymous sex and to the point where there's no speaking. And I think I've also kind of adapted some of the ways that I talk to my clients around that as well to be aware that, you know, maybe the first few times they might not say anything to each other at all or other than you know, some phrases of affirmation. Right. (laughs) Consent, right? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Um, But yeah, I I definitely agree that there comes tremendous power and and emotional connection and intimacy. If you can be, my spouse knows that uh, I get nervous. My spouse knows that I get excited or, you know, but if I just name it, then then I feel better myself. Right. You know? Right. Yeah. All right. So somebody, if you, if it's your first or second date, you might just sort of play it, take it slow. There's some room to explore alternatives to reduce mm-hmm. the expectations that it's going to be sex. As we get uh-huh. maybe more involved and more intimate yeah. with somebody, we might reveal, Hey, I get in my head. Sometimes it totally messes with my erection. And to say it in a way that is again, like not all or nothing that it's that it just, it's a normal ebb and flow of, of human functioning. Right, right. There is a, a sex therapy intervention called Wax and Wane, which you may have heard of. Mm-hmm. And I, I recommend that to lots of penis having folks in my practice to do it either by themselves or with their partner to get erect and then let go and allow the erection to go down and then get erect again and, and so on and so forth to show to themselves and their partners that the natural ebb and flow of human functioning I call it dick functioning. Right, <laughs> right but it's not like... Just to oh, add some you, levity. Right, right. It's yeah. not like, oh, you lose it once, it's gone forever. It's like it really exactly. can wax and wane. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that that leads to some relief of the frustration that can happen if a guy guy's erection goes down during sex. Hey, we're going to take just a short little break in the middle of the episode for you to let you know that if you want to get alerted whenever there's a new episode of Better Sex, if you want that straight to your text message inbox with a link so you can easily listen, it's easy to do. Just text me, podcast, at 206-309-8645. Again, 206-309-8645. Send me the word podcast, and you will be signed up for automated reminders that you'll get every week. Thanks. And now back to the show. Okay. So what are some other ways that somebody can work on this? You know, and again, in my own head, maybe it's because I only work with couples, but I picture that a lot of this would be done with a partner because that's where the anxiety is, right? We can't quite (laughs) simulate that at home by ourselves. So yeah. So I have some interventions individually and, and with partners. The individual interventions would be, you know, the wax and wane. The other one is incorporating the body scan meditation, uh, which was popularized by John Kabat-Zinn in the 70s. And, you know, it can last anywhere from a few minutes to however long you want, 45 hour. Um, and you start with the top of your head and you just, uh, you lay down, and you feel your yourself center into the ground and you start with the top of your head and you just Notice and become aware of your body, starting top, going all the way down, shoulders, arms, fingers, you know, chest and pelvic and legs and all that. And you just slowly raise your awareness around those other parts of your body. And then you take it to the next level by touching yourself and raising your awareness. And then after that, you do it again, but you masturbate. And you start to become aware of the sensations that you feel in the rest of your body. That's not just your penis Mm. and balls. And so that you can say, okay, my chest does get a little warm or my neck feels a little tingly. And that way it can help them raise their awareness of the rest of their body. So not so penis centric at that point, right? Yeah. 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 And then they can do that with partners too. And kind of this hybrid Masters and Johnson sensate focus sort of way where they're also aware of what it feels like to touch your partner or to be touched by your partner. And my hope and you know what I found with with some people that have done it is that it, it really does help slow them down and raise that awareness and that presence of mind away from being so penis centric. Okay. And then what are some of the interventions to do with a partner if you've got somebody on board to help you with anxiety? 
So this one, it would be a little bit of the, the body scan meditation, but uh, another one is actually the name of it. I kind of came up with, with a client of mine and I, I said, can I share this? with others? <laughs> He said, yes, please. I just think it's so lovely. It's called uh, host and guest. And I re just really like the idea of this really kind of homey community feel to it. So each partner takes a turn being the host and guest and the host will take what they know about their partner's interests and sensory inputs and create a room or area of their place to their liking with the right scents and flowers that like it or music or whatever. And then they invite the guest in and they have a nice night together and they just kind of focus on the guest and then they take turns. And then over time they start to, rather than it being focused on one person, they focus on themselves and the relationship and kind of work. And it's another type of like hybrid sensate focus model, but just really going nice and slow because, you know, anxiety, and we can also think about representation either through porn or through movies or TV show about just kind of the bang it out sex yeah. without the warm up, without the hi, how are you? So that way it, it really does slow them down to allow for just the natural progression of, of our hormones and our excitement and our neurochemistry working. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That makes sense in terms of just even just the slowing down gives you a chance to kind of calm down any anxiety, right? Like just take a few yeah. breaths <laughs> and be present. Yeah. And then by having them focus on like setting up the room and, and thinking about their partner, it gives their mind something to focus on Yeah. instead of, you know, the worries of what might happen or what might not happen. I really like mindfulness. I really like DBT and kind of thinking through, okay, well, what could happen? Like, what is, what is the worst case scenario and how could you recover from that? And what are some ways that you can kind of ride these emotions and wait till they dissipate on their own? And, and then what are some ways that you can help them dissipate? And just really thinking together and experiencing together what anxiety feels like for them and how to notice it, how to name it, how to write it out and how to soften it as best they can. And I, and I get that some of those answers are going to be individual for different people, but what do you recommend if the worst case scenario happens, which I think, you know, as I'm thinking about my clients are going to be thinking, I lose my erection. That's the worst case scenario. Right, <laughs> and right. I, and I, I suppose that my partner gets upset about it, but. Um, uh -huh. And that's, yeah, that's another piece too. Yeah. I think, so we talk about, okay, well, what does that mean to you if you lose your erection? And then I'm also kind of trying to be mindful about language too, about losing an erection. Yeah. Or like, you know, achieving or conquering. Or, right, right. And, you know, so, okay, we think about, okay, what is, is, does that have a meaning attached to it? Does does your whole identity as a man dissipate? Which for some guys, you know, I think male fragility, the way that in the States that we're raised is very fragile. I mean, I've, I've been told I've lost my man card many times and I didn't even know I had one. I didn't, it's too much responsibility. <laughs> Stop paying the membership dues. <laughs> so I think it's just really exploring, okay, if your erection does go down, what about you as a person and as a partner goes away as well? Yeah. And really just kind of investigating and being curious about that. And then what can you say to yourself? What can you say to your partner? You know, how can you normalize it? Also, one thing I'd like to do within couples therapy is to help partners think about some situations as a dilemma rather than a me versus you yeah. situation. Yes. And so we say, okay, this is a dilemma. So now we're standing side by side and we're looking at the thing in front of us rather than having the thing be between us. Yeah. And really coaching them on how to talk about that right with each other or their partner right yeah, uh, yeah and one thing i hear from couples a lot is historically if an erection were to fade <laughs> it becomes this emergency and both partners red flag red flag get it uh -huh. up again get it up and everybody's <laughs> focused on the penis and we're both everything either yeah. comes to a dead stop or all hands on deck you know which mm -hmm. is in its own way a lot of pressure <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. I, I feel like you almost have to kind of psych yourself out. Like you have to pretend like you're not paying attention to right, the penis. Right, and you're like, right. I'm not really looking at you. <laughs> exactly. There you are. Yeah. <laughs> but it's really true. I think that much. I mean, I, yeah. I will say to people, I think part of the answer to this is not needing an erection. And then as soon yes. as you have a way to be sexual where you don't need it. Oh, my gosh. Look at that. I mean, assuming oh. it's just the anxiety. It's yeah. amazing how how it will come back, you know? Yeah. There's another Reddit person that I helped just kind of think through. I mean, he came up with the idea himself, but just kind of think through what would be helpful. And it was really focusing on different aspects of his partner while he's making out with them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the smell of the hair, the feel of the skin. And then the next day he messaged me and just all caps, it worked. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was, yeah, that was fun to hear. And you mentioned something, I don't know if we sort of touched on this in some of this conversation already, but the circular model of sex. Yeah. And how that might relate to anxiety? 
So this is adopted from uh, Martha Cowpey, who actually just released a great book on clinical toolkit working with polyamory. Oh folks. yeah, yeah, yeah. I talked to her about yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah, I, Martha's great. And I work with a lot with poly and kinky folks. And so that was cool to see. We're often raised in our culture to think about a linear model of sex, where it's just like this elevator. We're working our way up to it. Mm. And so it starts with that that glance and then holding hands and then making out and then oral sex maybe and penetrative and then orgasm maybe and then probably sleep. <laughs> uh, and the circular model sex, uh, the way I think of it is like you're just on this like 1970s circular bed. There's one of those round beds that you saw. And just around the edge of the bed is just this cornucopia smorgasbord of all the things that you could do sexually. So it can be oral sex and it can be oral sex to orgasm. It can be massage. It can be flogging. It can be spanking. It can be kissing, parcheesi, whatever you want it to be there. And you get to just kind of pick them like little grapes around you. And just because you stop having oral sex doesn't mean that the whole thing's over or just because an erection fades or, you know, you get overly heated or whatnot doesn't mean that it has to stop, which is what the linear model of sex says is if you miss one step, then it's over. over. Yeah. 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 Well, and it's also hierarchical, right? As if these, you know, penetrative sex and orgasm are somehow more important <laughs> right. than these others, the which puts, right, puts that much more pressure on the whole thing. Yeah. And so that, right, that's a really solid point. It just kind of, in the best way possible, it, it flattens all of those options so that they're all kind of in this, this equal territory. And right. yeah, I mean, you know, you've probably heard people say like, oh, it wasn't really sex because it was just oral or it was just hands, or it wasn't really like that great because it was just this or that. But with the circular yeah. model sex, if you are intimate and connected with the person and present enough and and you're doing what you want to do, then it is sex because hell, you get to name it. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. I say, right. It's about pleasure and connection. It doesn't matter what the body parts are doing. Mm -hmm. So, and it seems to me too, so much of the point is to enjoy the heck out of whatever it is you're doing. Yeah. Right. Like even the word foreplay, right? Like it was right. we're working up to the real thing. It's like, no, <laughs> just enjoy whatever you're doing. Yeah. And I think that's the thing that I really love about this work and my job working in sex shops was helping people find what makes them feel you know, pleasure and desire and helps them put their their needs and desires into their own hands and to their own sense of agency. And, you know, that's why I think it's really important in the book and in the groups that I run to have that communication part to talk about. Now that you are starting to get a grasp or, or you are, do you have a grasp of what you like? How do you communicate this? And, and, and what's your voice? All right, you've mentioned the workbook. I want to give you a minute to talk about where people can find you, about what you've got available. I assume they can find you somewhere besides Reddit, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, yeah, you can go on to warriortherapy.com. Warrior with an O. Warrior right? with an okay. O. It's a play on the word warrior for men's therapy. And so warrior with an O therapy.com. And that'll send you to all my links. So you can find my book on, on Etsy or Amazon or my website, davidfkhalili.com. And also on warriortherapy.com are my uh, social links on TikTok and Instagram and Twitter and all that good stuff. Sometimes on there to give out free advice. Okay, yeah. great. Well, thank you so much for being with me. You've been listening to Better Sex. Please visit our website, bettersexpodcast.com, for show notes and additional episodes. And that's a wrap for today. I really hope you enjoyed the episode. If you are enjoying the podcast, if some of this material resonates with you and you would like to make a difference and make sure that this keeps coming out in the world once a week, ongoing, there are a couple things you could do to show your appreciation. The first would be to go to iTunes and rate and review the show. That really helps us be found by new listeners when you review the show on iTunes. You can find a link at bettersexpodcast.com slash iTunes. The other thing I want to invite you to consider is becoming a Patreon. For a small monthly pledge, you get some benefits. So for $2 a month, you get advanced access to every single episode. For $5 a month, you get a chapter of my upcoming new book. And for $10 a month, I host quarterly get-to-know-you and question-and-answer chats over the web, and you get invited to that. 
I would love to have your membership in that. Become part of the Better Sex family. You can find a link at bettersexpodcast.com slash Patreon, which is P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Again, thanks for listening. I'm glad you're here. Feel free to comment, ask questions, get in touch. I'd love to hear from listeners. Thanks. Thanks.